A spate of earthquakes and floods in New Zealand this week may have many of us wondering how we would cope if caught up in a natural disaster. Christchurch-based author Paul Gorman is speaking on crisis communication at a Dunedin Science Conference. He joins us now. Good evening, Paul. Thank you, Rebecca. The Kaikoura quake, I understand, delayed you from speaking at the conference. Did yes, it, it did. Did, did yeah. it reaffirm your belief in the need of good communication during a disaster? It definitely did. And it was also um, an unwelcome reminder of what it's like to live through those kinds of things. Um, I've been feeling very traumatised today as a result and just thinking what the people of Kaikoura and further north are going to be dealing with in the next, e well, years, years, I would say. That's, yeah. Now when we say it delayed you from speaking, is that because you, it took you longer to get here or was it postponed um, to the conference? I, I was writing stories for the Stuff website between about midnight after the quake hit and three o'clock. Uh, I went back to bed and I was planning on getting up early to drive to Dunedin and I spent most of the night looking at my phone at mm. Twitter about the yeah. uh, tsunami warnings. I just couldn't sleep and I thought, no, I have to go to work. I can't really drive <laughs> to Dunedin. So I went to work and left and then drove to Dunedin and yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a long day. Now what key points about earthquake communication do you want to drive home during the conference here? Okay, well of course I missed my slot to talk at the conference, but I think what I would have said was that um, what we really need in times of crisis like that is empathy. Um, I think we've actually got probably more empathetic political leaders than we might give them credit for. Um, but what we saw in Christchurch is there's a lot of organisations below that level who sometimes forget they're dealing with people mm. uh, in a very stressed time and in a very sort of harassed state. Um, there needs to be transparency and that was one of the things I experienced as a journalist, very difficult getting answers to questions sometimes, especially my area of science. A lot of people said to me they, they found it helped them, you know, understanding what had caused the earthquake, uh, it really helped them deal with it. And so, you know, trying to find that sort of information out was not always easy. And sometimes I was told, look, people are already scared enough. Um, we don't want you going there, basically, asking those questions. That was especially after the February quake. Mm. Um, so, yeah, empathy, transparency, good communication. And, of course, that can be done in any kind of way now, you know, um, social media, online, still in print, TV, you know, radio. Um, and what we found too was that the local scientists who were there going through the event um, were actually their message the public engaged more with them because they the public knew they were also going through the same thing whereas you know we were talking to people in wellington and um, they weren't experiencing the quakes so they didn't you know have quite that same yeah empathy. Mm. So yeah. It's, it's around the other way now isn't it? Well yeah that's mm. right yeah. Now speaking of communication and, and, and spending quite some time on social media checking the warnings on yeah. that night I did the same per perhaps not for as many hours as you. Yeah. What, what, how do you feel about the particularly the tsunami warnings? I was waiting because I live in low-lying Dunedin area I was waiting for some information. One yeah. Dunedin MP was quite critical of civil defence saying that they were asleep and those were her words on social media Media. Yeah. I followed a few links and, and it was quite some time, 30, 40 minutes in between updates from civil defence. Okay, I don't know a lot of the ins and outs of what happened. I know there was also a concern in Christchurch about how long mm. it took before the tsunami sirens yes. went off. One thing I, I, I do know is that because the actual, the epicentre of the quake was onshore, um, there were people that probably didn't think that there would be any chance of a tsunami. Mm. But of course, then once they started analysing it, they found that the, the fault had actually ruptured offshore. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I guess it's, it's difficult because there's a national kind of civil defence mm. body and the local ones. I'm not quite sure how they work in together. Mm. What are your thoughts after Kaikoura about the Lower South Island being hit by a major quake? I think the biggest threat, and I, I'm, I'm not a, um, a, a quake scientist, I'm a journalist that's written a lot about earthquakes, but my understanding is the biggest threat to um, Otago, Dunedin, South Otago, um, uh, would be from a local source earthquake. Um, there's quite a few faults. Like when I lived in Dunedin, I felt quite comfortable here. I had no mm. idea there were so many yes. faults around, um, like, Brighton and sort of South Otago around the coast, the Tea Tree Fault, 
the Akator fault. Mm. Um, and what the um, research on those has shown that they do move and they can generate quite big quakes. But my understanding of that is there's not a regular pattern, so it's very difficult to know how close they might be mm. to being, you know, to doing that again. Um, further into Southland, I don't know a lot about the local faults there, but they're closer to Fiordland and the Alpine Fault, so that would be more of a concern, I'd imagine, there. Things, oh, we just need to be prepared, but to try not to worry about them. Mm. Christchurch-based author Paul Gorman, thanks very much for taking some time out to speak with us thanks, today. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks.